First off, can you tell me a little bit about coming up with this idea? Because I watch a lot of horror movies, a lot of possession movies, and it kind of blows my mind that I've never stopped to think, what is life like for someone post-exorcism? Yeah, um, coming up with the idea. Well, yeah, I love possession movies as well, and I really wanted to make a possession movie, and I didn't want to do it unless I could do some, like, approach it with a fresh angle or, you know, add something to the genre. So, um, but I didn't, I mean, I... While I was in post-production on my last film, I was just really exploring the idea, writing a lot of different drafts of treatments until, until I, I remember the moment, but I don't know what it was. It was sort of like I had explored all these different ideas and then I arrived at, oh, she could be recovering from that. And there was something just about like, a kind of dark wish fulfillment fantasy like you know if you could wake up having done all sorts of crazy stuff that you don't remember and like is it your fault are you know are you responsible for it i think that that was part of it as well how about getting it off the ground because when we spoke about that for i think it was what was it two and a half years ago it was, you were, um, what, yeah, it was about something three. like that yeah, two and a half, whatever. three. Two, two and a half years ago, yeah, exactly. You were first oh. developing this, so what was it that kind of got you that green light? Um, well, oh, well, uh, there's a money thing, and that's just a tricky and kind of crazy, and uh, I mean, you know, I don't want to say too much about that because it's so scary, and you know, <laughs> the risks that you take just sort of pushing ahead, and you know, maybe you don't have all the money, and you and you just kind of got to act as if you do, and then you get through it somehow. It, it's a... <laughs> Hopefully the demons or the angels help you along the way. Um, yeah. But, uh, but you know, there were two elements. One was like, I really couldn't, this, this, is, a not, this is a potential in a script form to be an ensemble cast, but I couldn't really start to cast certainly any of the family members without having Ava. So once uh, my producer, Carlos Velasquez, like, like started suggesting Luisa, he is working with her on another movie and then I watched all their films and I knew I wasn't going to get luckier than that to like work with with her on this so once we had Ava that really sort of set the ball rolling and I, um, I found a location in Bushwick a kind of warehouse building where we could for, for cheap we could take over and um, and, and, and film on several floors and on the roof and sort of set up a little production office. So with those two elements, then it just started to become very real. Like, we know Ava and we know where she lives. And now like we can, <laughs> yes. and, and we could build some sets in this place too, which was, you know, I was really worried about how do we, I think people watch movies like, um, like Danny Boyle's first film, um, called <laughs> it was a shallow grave and uh, it's all in an apartment and and you think oh that's simple you just go into an apartment but, you know if you watch the making of it's it's they build those sets they got to if you're in, even if you're in one location you want to have control over it so it was nice to that was part they of it built you know? that you guys they built it yeah like, no, I loved we didn't, it I and wanted it wasn't to like this... move there <laughs> I love my room I just yeah and that was part of just making it look great as, as good as we could did you have any say in the decorations in the room? No, I didn't. I didn't. I, no, I just showed up and I was just like, wow, this is a cool room. <laughs> I wanted, I, I did have a say in taking home one of the lanterns in my room. <laughs> That's important Four, stuff. Yeah. Set swag. So were you offered the part or was there any kind of audition process involved? Mm, no, I mean, uh, I just watched all of Louise's movies. Okay, so essentially the audition, which... She didn't know it was an audition. I didn't was, know. She, I, we hadn't met before, but I knew that I was watching her movies, and Carlos had told me about her, and so it was. And then I went. We, I saw Louisa across the room at an after party for a Ben Stiller movie. Both my manager brought me to this premiere, and I was like, I'm "Just go talk to her." And I'm just gonna. I won't like mention this movie. I'll just say, "Hey, you know my producers. You worked with them before." And I had no and, idea who you yeah, were. Yeah, it was like, and she was, was really, really nice. she was she was really sweet, and like, <laughs> I don't know, it's just that moment of like, I'm not gonna bring the movie into this. I just want to see what it's like to meet, and it was, and it was cool, and that sort of, 
the, the couple days later, then uh, Carlos sent her the script and was like, you want to do this movie? And then we met for coffee and talked about the movie. But How did you know that she'd be able to handle possessed Ava? Because like most of it is like you being kind of like a nice normal person and reacting right. how anyone might, but there are a couple of moments when where... When I watched King Kelly, I knew that she could do it because that was part of it. She was so different when I walked up to her at this party than King Kelly. I was like, oh, she can transform. like, And, and it won't seem like she's transforming. It'll just be, it'll be a different person. So that was... That was, I think, the part that made me, really convinced me that she was going to be the right person for that. How much character work did you guys do before you actually shot it? Because we, we get a general sense of what kind of person she is and then what happens to her after, but you ever work out like silly details, like how she, what her relationships were like with her friends even beforehand? Well, yeah, I mean, we talked about it a lot, and, and I know that Louisa, I mean, when we... She read the script in January, she's cast in January, we filmed in May, and we, she, we were both busy and she was working on other stuff until then, so around April we met up, mm -hmm. sort of for mm -hmm. the first time, we were like, okay, let's start working on this. And she just, she pulled out like a notebook, <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, and I, we just started talking about it and she was writing, and, but she had already written all this other stuff, so I, I mean, I'm not, I don't want to like, you know, show too much behind the curtain. Right. That was her process, but I was, I was like impressed and, and grateful that she was clearly just like, gonna get into this character, really create it. Yeah, it's like, it's important to, because obviously there's the whole script there, and, but it's figuring out who this girl is, you know, and she's also, I think within the film, sort of trying to figure, oh, well, she's trying to figure out what happened in the time that she lost, and then she's kind of trying to figure out who she wants to be. Um, and, and the discovery she makes within that, the, within her mystery solving, helps her figure out who she wants to be, ultimately. But, um, but what was I gonna say? I don't even remember. Um, oh, oh, yeah, so I, I, would, I, I sort of wrote out my, my relationships and sort of a, a history. Um, I remember we were like walking and I was telling him about, you know, my boyfriend and my family and, and coming into to dance because I wanted to be a dancer, but then, but, and also always going in the art. But anyway, so I, I sort of, I had to figure she out. She wrote I, like a war and peace novel to like <laughs> create like a character and it was awesome. And like we were walking around because we were doing, we were going, we were looking for wardrobe for Ava, and I just, I was, I really wanted to, like, make sure that, like, her clothes were, were that kind of reflected all the different uh, layers of this character, and um, so we went around the city, found, like, a couple showrooms where, like, I had friends that would, like, anyway, so while we were walking around, she was telling me, like, Ava's backstory, and it was, I mean, it was so cool. I was like, wow, this is, like, the prequel. I mean, this is... The graphic novel that leads up to the movie. I love funny, it. I'd yeah. want to see that movie. I like this right. movie, and then I also want to see what happens after. I really think right. you need to turn the SPA into a TV show. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I that. would watch yeah. that, and totally. I would love it. Cool. Yeah. No, that's definitely just something I would love to explore. Is there a lot more detail you figured out about that organization that we don't see in the film? Yeah, I mean, that was something that um, we had to simplify a bit for the film. I, um, and I was used to that, like in Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are Undead, my first film, I had to really take, like trim that down for the movie um, as well, like this back conspiracy. So I, I, I did that with this. But I mean, it, was, it started, I mean, before I knew that I wanted to make a, this script, a movie about a girl who's recovering from possession, it started as a movie about a government organization like sort of Men in Black that was with demons. Um, and so that sort of, that was too big and I wasn't gonna be able to do that and have control over it. So I went this way and then, then I found that when I had this character of Ava recovering and she goes to the group, then that was sort of like, oh, that's how that ties into this original idea that I had where there's an organization. Except this will be more like, you know, um, like in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, uh, the Watcher, Anthony, what's his name, that actor? Uh, anyway, like, Buffy's got a Watcher and you don't really know that he's connected to like this, this whole other group of Watchers. Um, 
and so that's that's how I picture Tony. You know, he's got he's got other people that he talks to that we don't necessarily see in the movie. Another reason to expand beyond Ava's possessions because yes. I'm genuinely curious. Like I wish I could sit here with that handbook and kind of flip through it. <laughs> there's so many little tiny details that you come up with that just kind of totally make sense. Like it's crazy that. It makes sense that someone would be possessed, do all of these crimes, and then be liable for them <laughs> <Yeah>. after. <laughs> well, I like. I wanted to. I, I was watching the movie, and I was like, "Oh my god, I am such a. I'm being such a fangirl right now." I, it's like one of those movies that when you're when you're younger, I think it's like it's so cool, and you want to you want to rewatch it, and 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 like I would I make the demon steeper, you know? <laughs> I'd be like one of those people, and, and it's just cool. It's like I'd probably cool, be doing the same exact thing. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> like have a cloak and do a magic thing, and <laughs> I think you referenced uh, Rosemary's Baby when we last talked with us. Were, were there any other influences that these characters or this world kind of grew from? There were a lot of inf- there were a lot. I mean, I when I whenever I go to make a movie, I just sort of draw from all the movies that I love. Um, I mean, certainly, like with the with the recovery group stuff, I thought a lot about how that was treated in Fight Club. You know, uh, this sort of dark humor. It's a little this is depressing, but it's also hilarious, and it's so that was part of it. Um, and the, you know, the music was a big was a big part of it too. So Sean Lennon and I like talk a lot about like the scores to these movies, like The Shining or how music is mo- used in Blue Velvet. And um, and even for me, I really wanted to take it in and push him to do more of like a little bit more pop, rock, indie. So certainly like Nicholas Winding Refn's use of music was like a big influence on me and, 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 and him. Um, Although I don't think it sounds like that, but it has that kind of energy where like you're in this genre film and then suddenly like there's a kind of cool rock music comes in and just takes you through it in, a, in, a, in an unexpected kind of a way. It pairs well with what you did with the lighting too. There's some cool. pretty bold <laughs> choices in there and it kind of gives the film a really original, unique flair mm-hmm. and, it, and ups the comedy a bit too. Yeah, yeah. I um, There was something with the cinematographer. I mean, I made, I, I made these... Uh, you know, visual reference Bibles for all the departments, and I just tried to, it was nice that right before filming, we got I got to sit down with the production designer and cinematographer and the costume designer and, uh, and just talk about, like, how are we going to make this movie, like, look coherent, but also very, very stylish. I mean, and I was, I wanted to, you know, I wanted David Lynch, I wanted Wong Kar Wai, I just wanted to just, Strive for as much greatness and, and beauty as possible in the in the frame, and the sort of haze of Ridley and Tony Scott, those early movies like The Hunger and True Romance, and so we. I was asking a lot of the crew, but um, I just felt that like, why put all this work into something if we're not going to just try to make it great? You know, so I think that's pretty fair. Out. You ever just for fun consider what might have happened to like famous people who were possessed in movies? Like, <laughs> I mean, real sad. like post Rosemary's Baby almost. Yeah. Like, what if she got past all of that and had to go through some sort of situation like this? Yeah. No. Exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, there is you know there is a sequel because people. It's funny when I pitched this movie, people would say like, "Oh, like The Exorcist Part Two. and I'm like, well, "There is a sequel to The Exorcist, and it's ridiculous." <laughs> Um, it's a John Borman movie, and uh, uh, Richard Burton plays the pre. It's this, it's a psychedelic, wacky movie um, that is that this is not. But I mean, <laughs> I heard that actually the the writer of Rosemary's Baby wrote a sequel, or he's writing a sequel now. Did you know? Now, that? which is interesting because Stephen King just published a sequel to The Shining. That's mm. true. I think I was distracted by the Rosemary's Baby TV show that came and went. Oh, that was too very, bad. Very, very, very fast. Yeah, that was too bad. That they uh, not that it went fast, just that they didn't really. I don't know. They tried. It, it, as far as TV shows go, it's kind of like <laughs> don't like water it down. TV is obviously a bold medium now, so really with anything, it's kind of not easy to play with any idea that people consider a classic or iconic. And I mean, you kind of do it here. I mean, you take a risk and it pays off. Cool. Thanks. 
So what about what's coming next? I want to know if you're ever going to make that reverse misery movie. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's, I actually, I've never forgotten about that. That's really cool that you brought that up. No, I want to make that movie next, actually, but I, I've added, I, 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 there was Christmas break happened in the middle of you know the holidays happened in the middle of my post production process on this, so there was a month when I couldn't really do any work because I was relying on you know the sound design and special effects and everybody was on vacation and. I rewrote that script based on my experiences on this movie, and so I, uh, yeah, I, I've added a kind of a, an Inception vibe to it. That's all I'm going to say. 